The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan, by Samuel Tomsick. This is part one of chapter four. Chapter four is called, What is the Capitalist Discourse? And part one of chapter four is called, Marx and the Theory of Discourses. Marx's analysis of the commodity form and its anticipation of the autonomy of the signifier gives way to a materialist reorientation of ontology that questions the two Parmenidian axioms that initiated philosophy, the sameness of thinking and being and the univocity of being. Following this line, Alfred Sonrethel famously suggested that modern ontological categories are correlative to capitalist abstractions, and he went even so far as to condition the historic emergence of systematic thinking, philosophy and mathematics, with the economic exchange and the introduction of the general equivalent. Whether we subscribe to Sonrethel's thesis or not, the commodity form most certainly touches a fundamental speculative question concerning the ontological status of discursive production. Capitalist as well as technological, mathematical, and linguistic objects, and the way structural relations complicate the presumed sameness of thinking and being, the the Lacanian Marxist take on the problematic would perform an additional turn in Sonrethel's perspective, not simply reducing ontological categories to economic abstractions, but circumscribing the ontological theses that are implicitly articulated in the theories and actions of political economy. The model for such an undertaking is again Marx's critique of fetishism, which most openly exposes the ontological and even the ontotheological aspiration of economic theories. The rootedness of economic knowledge in the fantasy of self-engendering value leaves the structural relations unthematized, removing their imminent deadlocks from the picture. For this reason, political economy is a pseudoscience, standing closer to alchemy and astrology rather than chemistry and astronomy. A theory of relations of production, however, not only reintroduces the rejected problematic of the structural non-relation which drives the capitalist mode of production, but in the same move proposes a critical epistemology in a materialist ontology of discursive consequences. Let us recall the minimal common ground of the critique of political economy and that of psychoanalysis. Marx and Freud both insisted that the symbolic networks operate beyond consciousness and are endowed with causality, the power to work back on conscious subjects. Their autonomy involves two main consequences, a subject whose being comes down to non-identity and loss, and a surplus object, whose being is marked by intensification or increase. The immediate result is an underlying asymmetry between the lack in being and the surplus in being. This is the critical point of departure for the Freudian and the Marxian displacement of the ontological problematic. Once the discourse is theorized in a materialist way, as autonomous and effective, being turns out to be marked by instability and contradiction, contradiction, split between decrease and increase. It is not surprising that Marx and Freud find in the energetic notion of entropy the crucial scientific reference in order to theorize this structural imbalance. Lacan pursued this line throughout his teaching. The subject's dependency on the signifier marks being with metonymy, in which the emergence of the subject exchanges with its disappearance in the chain of differences. Once the philosophical question of being is reformulated, the gap of the unconscious may be said to be pre-ontological, in the double sense that it determines the subject's mode of being and that it becomes a precondition of ontology once the autonomy of the signifier has become the object of inquiry in at least three revolutionary human sciences, the critique of political economy, psychoanalysis, and structural linguistics. The production of the surplus object addresses the flip side of this subjective drama. Through its analysis, Marx questions another philosophical classicism, the ancient division between praxis, 
the activity of free men aiming at perfection and self-realization, and poiesis, the activity of slaves constrained by natural laws and material conditions. Hence, action rooted in freedom and action out of necessity. The true accomplishment, the true accomplishment of Marx's critique consists in the abolition of this distinction. Their, uh, their, contigui- their contiguity affects the highest form of human production, theoria, the production of concepts and knowledge. Marx's critique of theoria, theoria, <laughs> turns around the equivocity of commodities, which is stated in nearly all the introductory lines in the first chapter of Capital. A commodity is, first of all, an external object. Initially, the commodity appeared to us as an object with a dual character, possessing both use value and exchange value. They only appear as commodities or have the form of commodities insofar as they possess a double form, i.e. natural form and value form. A commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing, but its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Marx inverts the classical metaphysical strategy, say Aristotle, who departs from the equivocity of being in order to establish its univocity through the system of categories. Commodity, by contrast, appears univocal, but the split between use value, empirical materiality, and exchange value, discursive materiality, reveals that the production is internally doubled. The lesson of the double character of commodity reaches beyond the framework of the capitalist problematic and echoes the ancient scandal of sophistry, whose rhetorical techniques demonstrated language is not merely a house of being, but a particular factory that produces within being more being. The shared discovery of Marx and Freud, however, consists in the fact that this production also contains more than being objects that are irreducible to the opposition of being and non-being, precisely surplus value and surplus jouissance. The shift to discursive production retrospectively uncovered the double historical foundation of ontology, pitting Heraclitus against Permenides, movement against rest, materialism against idealism. The crucial aspect of this opposition concerned the claim that the signifier is an essential part of the question of being. Lacan's later quarrel with philosophy was therefore focused around the jouissance of being, the inclusion of production in the register of ontological inquiries. As already noted, this material materialism right echoes in the historical foundations of ontology. I fail to see in what sense I am stooping to the ideals of materialism when I identify the reason for the being of signifierness in jouissance, jouissance of the body. But you see, a body hasn't seemed materialistic enough since Democritus. In fact, the atom is simply an element of flying signifierness. It is extremely difficult to make it work outright when one retains only what makes the element an element, namely the fact that it is unique, whereas one should introduce the other a little bit namely, difference. Democritus was the first one to problematize the university of matter, the introduction of the atom, this radical real, as Lacan claimed on another occasion, distinguishes the materiality of composed bodies and the materiality of the elements, which should be conceived not through their uniqueness, but through their relation. The first orientation remains caught in vulgar materialism, where the materiality of atoms remains unquestioned and empirical, while the introduction of difference and and metonymy, flying signifierness, grounds an orientation that theorizes the materiality of structural relations and exposes the equivocity of matter, the very same equivocity that returns through the examination of the linguistic structure and the causality of the signifier. In equivocity, meaning and jouissance overlap, and through this overlapping, the autonomy of discursive production undermines the philosophical hypothesis of the univocity of being. 
No surprise then that at the background of this materialist orientation, Lacan recalled the initial tension in philosophy. The fact that thought moves in the direction of a science only by being attributed to thinking, in other words, the fact that being is presumed to think, is what founds the philosophical tradition starting from Parmenides. Parmenides was wrong and Heraclitus was right. That is clinched by the fact that, in fragment 93, Heraclitus enunciates, he neither avows nor hides, he signifies, putting back in its place the discourse of the powerful. The prince, in other words, the powerful, who prophesies in Delphi. The Parmenidian founding axiom of ontology matters less than the Heraclitian prince, the master, and even the master's discourse. The identification of ontology with the master's discourse is a constant in Lacan's later teaching, which departs from the non-identity and the equivocity of the signifier. The Parmenidian axiom, however, contains a double identity, besides that of thinking and being, also the self-identity of thinking, the thinking of thinking, that is, according to Aristotle, actualized in metaphysics. Modernity transformed this transparency of thinking into the subject of cognition and into homo economicus, the identity of private interest with the positive knowledge of this interest. Marx's rejection of the political economic fantasies of social homeostasis and market providence significantly directed Lacan's attempt to formalize the contradictions of the autonomy of the signifier. They both start from the inversion of the spontaneous philosophy of political economy best summarized in the controversial Thatcher axiom, there is no such thing as society. This statement targets Marx's discovery that social reality is traversed by class struggles and that consequently society is essentially grounded on the inexistence of social relation. Liberalism and neoliberalism, however, claim that there is only social relation, precisely the social relation that Marx summarizes in the four cornerstones of the capitalist worldview. There's the social relation as the unpronounced corollary of the neoliberal slogan, there's no such thing as society. Lacan's theory of discourses is thus an attempt to formalize the inexistence of social relation and its material consequences. The term discourse underwent a significant development throughout Lacan's teaching. At first synonymous to speech, it later quite openly translated Marx's mode of production. Recall that the homology of surplus value and surplus jouissance determined two heterogeneous but interrelated axes in the autonomy of the signifier. One, the axis of representation, comprising the relation between the signifiers and the subject, and recapitulated in Lacan's definition of the signifier. The signifier is what represents a subject to another signifier and two, the axis of production addressing the relation between the signifiers and the object and elaborated throughout a structural reading of Marx's deduction of surplus value. The structure comes down to a parallax. From the position of the surplus object, it appears that values and signifiers interact without any reference to the subject. The contemporary fascination with the absolute autonomy of fictitious capital and the psychoanalytic thesis on the, on the autism of jouissance, or the generalized perversion, privilege this position. From the position of the subject, however, signifiers seem to be evacuated of jouissance, and the subject appears to be deprived of the surplus product. With this parallax in mind, we can observe that Marx's critique of political economy assumes neither the position of the subject, which still marked his humanist accounts of alienation, nor the position of the object, from which political economy articulates its fetishist theories of value. Critique assumes the impossible position of the parallax, which is expressed in the coexistence of the corrected labor theory of value and the dialectic of fetishism. We should again recall that, during his earlier teaching, Lacan privileged the antagonistic relation between the signifier and jouissance, in which the former entails a mortification of the latter. The parallax of representation and production, formalized in the theory of discourses, finally resolves the question, how do both processes intertwine? 
They stand in a topological relation of simultaneous continuity and rupture, which additionally con contextualizes the discrepancy between appearance and structural relations that Marx traced throughout his critical work. The break in question is resumed in the following diagram of the social link. Um, okay, so again, there's a diagram. Actually, there ends up being another diagram also on this page. It's page 360. So look that up. The square indicates the relations that are operative in both processes and can be decomposed into two triangles. The triangle of representation on the left and the triangle of production on the right. Based on the logic of the signifier, the four elements of the social link are named the master signifier, S1, knowledge or the battery of signifiers, S2, the subject of representation, dollar sign, and the object of production, A. As we know, the elements are embedded in circulation, which enables the deduction of three other structures on the background of the, genera, of the, gen, the, fuck, the general logic and topology of the signifier. For the four discursive places, Lacan proposed different nominations, which can be provisionally called Marxian and Freudian, depending on the notions deployed in their nomination. The first and most recurrent nomination is proposed in Radiophony and in Seminar 17, and repeated three years later in Seminar 20. And then there's another, there's another diagram but it's like agent above truth. And then beside that, it's labor above product. And like by above, I mean, it's like divided by a dotted line. Definitely probably want to look at it. This nomination openly addresses Marx's correction of the labor theory of value and the invention of the social symptom. The proletarian, which assumes the position of truth, the same place where Lacan situates the subject of the unconscious. The relations in the discursive square in back in image two are no less important because they indicate that truth is the place of a constitutive split the realization of the autonomy of differences seminar 17 proposes yet another nomination which aims at the lessons of freud's labor theory of the unconscious um, again there's like desire above truth and separated by a dotted line and then beside that is other above loss and separated by a dotted line um, that would be on page 361. On this second nomination, Lacan reminds his audience that it dates back to the time when he defined the subject's desire as desire of the other. Alienation is now openly identified with the structure of the social link, and in regard to the four discourses that follow from the rotation of elements um, in image 3, it also shows four possible faces, depending on which element occupies the position of truth. In the master's discourse, alienation concerns the subject labor power represented between two signifiers values and mobilized in order to work for the satisfaction of the unconscious capitalist. In the university discourse, alienation concerns the master signifier, revealing that it is pure difference to another signifier, but also an empty, insatiable imp imperative of production. In the hysteric discourse, alienation assumes the form of the object A, which now unveils its metonomic status and can be recognized as the element around which the insatiability of demand is articulated. Finally, in the analytic discourse, alienation assumes the form of the unconscious, knowledge that does not know itself, but is nevertheless put to work in the production process. With this shift, the analytic discourse stands at the opposite end of the master's discourse and is even its inversion. Its critical value consists in the fact that it determines the root of the given relations of domination and initiates the production of a new master signifier, which could potentially ground a new social link. This logic is not foreign to Marx, whose critique of political economy equally turned around the production of a new political master signifier, which would announce the possibility of a social order, in which the foundation of social links on the imperatives of capital and the private interests of the capitalist class would be abolished. Was Marx an analyst of the proletariat? A crucial factor for Lacan's systematic inclusion of production in the already elaborated logic of representation was May 68, 
While for some observers, these events demonstrated that structuralism encountered its limits in the notion of the event, Lacan proposed a conception of discourse that stands for a structure that walks in the streets, rejecting the opposition between the structure and the event. Structure is less about stable and necessary relations than about contingency and contradiction, and the privileged name for this structural articulation of contradiction is no other than revolution, albeit in the epistemological meaning of the term, circular movement which contains an imminent distortion. Hence Lacan's reservation towards revolutionary enthusiasm, which in his view marginalizes the structural aspect of revolution and its unpredictable or unwanted outcome. Like in the case of the Soviet Union that Lacan refers to in his confrontation with the revolutionary students. The theory of discourses will evolve around the discursive shift with which Lacan strived to account for the disruptive nature of May 68, and even more, more so for the failure of its agents to accomplish a transition towards the communist social order. This and nothing else was what Lacan aimed at when he compared the students with hysterics, who demand a new master, a new master signifier, which would replace the structuration of social links around the imperatives of capital. The structural disclosure supports the deduction of three discourses, which depart from the logic of the signifier, now called the master's discourse. Oh boy, image three, the four discourses. So there's, um, yeah, there's like a diagram you want to check out, 364. The vectors that connect the elements and their places indicate that the discourse is internally broken. Lacan's notion of non-all describes this disclosure. All discourses are grounded on a weak logic, which leaves room for imperfections, actualized in the form of epistemological, political, traumatic, and other events. The discursive logic consequently provides a minimum of consistency by constituting the subjective and social reality while simultaneously introducing in this reality a maximum of instability, that manifests through the formation of symptoms, crises, or revolutions. It is no coincidence that the link between this weak logic and the social uprisings, consistency and instability, was addressed at one of the symbolic sites of the student movement in France, University Paris um, 13? Yeah, 13, I think. The street and the university become two privileged sites where the action of structures can be observed. The theory of discourses proposes a redefinition of structuralism in a moment when it is already declared defeated or even buried. Structuralism now designates more than a mere science of language. It stands for a science of the structural real, extending the notion of structure from linguistics to other sciences in continuing to pursue a repetition of the modern scientific revolution in the field of human objects, language, labor, thinking. The master's discourse, the logic of the signifier, provides the four elements that compose a social link and determines the topological relation between representation and production, as well as the order according to which the elements relate to each other. The discursive shift reveals the compatibility between different discourses, depending on which articulation of elements follows from which shift. The quarter turn supports direct passage from the master's discourse to two other formations, the hysteric and the university. This immediacy signals that both transformations, far from overcoming the master's discourse, provide its, de its developments a regression or radicalization in the university discourse in which the master signifier assumes the position of truth and progress or destabilization in the hysterics discourse in which the truth concerning the produced surplus object is revealed. Departing from the function of the symptom, the hysterics discourse questions the master and thereby reveals the truth of the relations of production. The vectors between the discursive elements, however, show that the hysterics discourse preserves the same relation between the master signifier and surplus object as the master's discourse. What it alters is the product, which is now knowledge. The revolutionary discourse comprises a hysteric dimension as far as it produces knowledge, theory of value, 
which places the truth of the wealth of nations in the extraction of surplus labor from labor power. The right side of the formula, the master signifier above knowledge, suggests that Marx's questioning of the capitalist in the name and from the position of the proletarian produces knowledge of the capitalist mode of production. Finally, the discursive circulation shows that the knowledge produced in the confrontation between capital and labor power joins the proletarian. It is the labor theory of value and represents the epistemological ground of revolutionary or emancipatory politics. Was Marx a hysteric? Another exemplification of the relation between the masters and the hysterics discourse lies in the transformation of the epistemological status of hysteria through psychoanalysis. Before becoming the subject of the talking cure, hysteria was considered a limit of medical knowledge and was treated with obscure techniques such as hypnosis, hydrotherapy, and electroshocks. Simultaneously, the enigma of the hysterical symptom, its ambiguous status between the physiological and the psychological, give rise to an entire industry of knowledge. Freud's predecessors, from Charcot to Brouwer, labored to solve the hysterical enigma. In his contributions to the studies on hysteria, Brouwer, for instance, produced a theory of the so-called hypnoid states and speculated on the physiological aspects of hysteria, bashfully avoiding the sexual etiology and the theory of symbolization proposed by Freud. The studies themselves remain an important historical document of two thoroughly incompatible approaches to hysteria, the declining pseudoscientific hypnotism and the emerging psychoanalysis. While for hypnotism, the hysteric symptom remained ignorant and numb, Freud addressed it as a discursive formation, endowed with the power of speech, and a, and a form of knowledge that may not know itself, but still assumes the articulated form of signifiers. Freud thereby demonstrated two ways of producing the fourth discourse. By departing from the hysteric discourse, the patient's speech, or the university discourse, the critique of knowledge, in this case of Brouwer, or by directly inverting the master's discourse, hypnotism, starting from the repressed moment of Brouwer's analysis of Anna O., Bertha Pappenheim, the transference in which the analyst is reduced to the object of desire. <clears throat> Lacan consequently refined psychoanalysis as the inverse of the master's discourse. The analytic discourse is the only one that produces the complete inversion of the relations of domination, thus standing both inside and outside, on the border of the dominating mode of production. There's another compatibility between Marx and the theory of discourses. In the discourses, we can discern four possible forms of fetishization that are, in one way or another, linked to labor. In the master's discourse, the dominating appearance is that the master does the labor. Marx addresses this appearance through the critique of commodity fetishism that obfuscates obfu obfuscates the relation between value and labor power. The dominating appearance is that capital automatically creates value, and this structural appearance echoes in the false identification of money with the master signifier, which repeats the fetishist money labors. In the hysteric discourse, it appears that labor comes from the subject. Let us take again the relation between Brouwer and his patient. The process of treatment amounted in the production of knowledge but it was Brower and not Anna O. Oh who produced it. The patient addressed Brower as the subject supposed to know, and his theory of hypnoid states was the response to this interpolation. In the university discourse, knowledge appears as the laborer, but the actual labor is accomplished by surplus value, which in Marx's analysis of technology appears in its true form, unpaid surplus labor, and in Lacan's critique of the university as the student. Finally, in the analytic discourse, it seems that labor is done by the surplus object, now embodied by the analyst, but the actual labor, free association, takes place in the patient's unconscious, while the analyst's task is to disrupt the speech at critical points when the associative production amounts to a master signifier, which determines the analysand's relation to jouissance. The theory of discourse 
The theory of discourses The theory of discourses is not meant to provide a timeless theory of social links without relation to the present moment, nor is it alien to the historical development of capitalism. When Lacan presented it to the revolutionary students of Paris, um, 8, or no, wait, 13, sorry, Paris 13, he claimed that his theory aims to situate the target of their revolts, the logical and the structural opponent. However, the development of, this, of his theory contains a complication, since Lacan proposed three different formalizations of capitalism. The homology of surplus value and surplus jouissance identifies it with the master's discourse, but already one year later, Lacan declares the master's discourse to be the oldest, precisely because it stands for the logic of the signifier, for which it would be absurd to claim that it is historically conditioned by capitalism. The social dimension of the master's discourse is no longer discussed exclusively through the relation between the capitalist and the proletarian, but between the ancient master and the slave, in reference to Plato's Manon, and between the feudal lord and the serf, through Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Lacan traces the historical metamorphoses, the master figure, which ends in its capitalist liberation from concrete embodiments, and which is intensified by the foundation of social links on the fetishization of things rather than on the fetishization of persons. This liberation of the master, the flip side of what Marx's discussion of technology called the liberation of labor from its content, including the laborer, implies a groundbreaking discursive shift which introduces the modern form of domination, the university discourse, in which the master is decentralized and brought to the highest point of abstraction. The old master's discourse, which can still be associated with the early stages of industrial revolution, seems to describe the old spirit of capitalism, while the scientific progress and the development forms of capitalism imply an anonymous and headless master.